so hi, uh, I'm Pratyosha, um, co-founder of this company called Nemo Care. Um, so a little bit of myself and my background, Ashish tried to cover most of it and we had a very interesting chat on what to be talked about and things like that. Um, so there are certain set of people who um, are really comfortable when they are in their comfort zones and there's certain set of people who get really agitated if they are in their comfort zones. So luckily or unfortunately or unluckily or whatever, but I belonged to the second uh, set of people. So uh, I did engineering, electronics and communication and uh, worked in it for a bit. And uh, I very comfortably got into my comfort zone and then decided this is not what I want to do and decided to expand my boundaries, took up a field of um, industrial design, which at that time I thought was challenging and something that I did not know a lot of people were doing uh, coming from an engineering background. So I took up design uh, and it requires a certain streak of madness to be doing that. Um, and then while doing design, um, uh, I think it's the environment of National Institute of Design Ahmedabad, which increases or kind of nurtures that streak of madness. So Worked in design for a bit, industrial design, worked in, um, you know, stylizing products, worked in uh, all sorts of such usual typical product design work, and then um, fell into healthcare, did some of the most unthinkable um, things for me back then. Um, I worked with a professor called M.P. Ranjan, who actually initially pushed, us, pushed me into the field of healthcare, though I came from a family of doctors. Um, he said, think of what design can do in healthcare and um, gave us the, gave us a vehicle, gave us, said, pack your clothes for a month and then we went and stayed uh, in Panchmahal district, five little districts in Gujarat, stayed with these people to understand what are the challenges they face with healthcare. Worked, stayed, lived, ate with them for more than, more than a month. We initially thought of doing it for two weeks five weeks doing that, um, openly defecated where Satya is, yeah, <laughs> because none of them had toilets, um, um, lived that sort of a life, um, used cloth for periods because no pads were available, we weren't prepared to do that. Um, so literally lived that life and uh, came back, I think when we did came Came back, I think, um, Abhinjan or Vadiani was altered on some level. Where we came back and we said, This is crazy. This is crazy that we are using things which were not designed for us, trying to attain targets which are not meant for us, and eventually falling short of um, a lot of things, falling short on so many levels, uh, getting our basic health care. Um, so that drove us, and yes, went back, tried to work in a field. And when your DNA gets altered, obviously you have to again push your horizons. So uh, nothing was really working for me when I said maybe starting my own thing or doing my own work or trying to work on a problem that I felt personal uh, for, personally for, was a thing to do. So that kind of pushed me to become an entrepreneur. So yes, as a part of the entrepreneurship journey that I took up, um, we were a part, uh, we did a fellowship in biodesign, which was initially started out from Stanford, which um, the talks about how to design or how to go about the process of designing for healthcare. And as a part of that, spent a lot of time in uh, the field of healthcare, shadowing doctors, shadowing nurses, shadowing patients, uh, all the stakeholders involved with healthcare. And one of the really interesting uh, or really um, moving uh, incidences of that journey for me was uh, one of the tertiary care hospitals in one of the districts in uh, Telangana. We were um, uh, doing an immersion and we were there and uh, trying to understand how these nurses are catering to newborn health. And uh, we were in one of the NICUs, the neonatal intensive care unit, when um, what struck me, that, that incident is something that I'll never forget because uh, I was a new mother at that time. My son was only um, so I, we were in the NICU and um, the nurse actually was talking to one of the mothers 
uh, not the mother actually, the mother-in-law, the mother, I think, the mother of the pregnant lady who was a caretaker of the newborn and um, they come in one day. I said, how do you allow these people in into the NICU, you know? It's, it's very non-intuitive that that wouldn't happen in, in a bigger, higher setting. I said, yeah, we do restrict, but then we have to have this caretaker coming and checking on the baby. I said, why? Uh, then uh, she said, our standing instructions to these caretakers or the mothers is come in and check in on your baby every one hour. Otherwise, there's a fair chance the baby might be dead. I was shocked. I said, this is an NIC. Uh, and she said, yeah. But we, are two of the nurses on duty, are looking after 40 newborn babies in that NIC. And uh, we do not have, very clearly what I could see there was, uh, call these monitoring support system for a patient in an NICU, which is the big multi-parameter monitors that you see, um, which continuously monitor the health status of the baby. They're not sufficient. We don't have enough of them. If you go to any tertiary care center, you will see that there will be two working monitors for about 40 patients, and those two are kept on the most critical baby who has the 1% chance to survive. So this is the dire situation. and. 8 million, sir, 8 million clinically low birth weight babies being born in India every year are in requirement of this sort of monitoring support. But we do not have enough, and 400,000 of them die every year. Lack of basic monitoring, basic uh, stuff that could actually save their lives. 80% of these deaths are preventable only if we have. Uh, the requirement, the equipment to do so, or the caretaker or person who can monitor monitor the baby continuously and identify the distress or the right time when an intervention has to happen. So in an advanced setting, like if most of you will have babies or you already have and you'll be in the Apollos or the Cloud Nines or the birthplaces of this uh, country and what, 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 you, what you'll notice there is if your baby is in the NICU or in a critical care environment in such hospital, there will be at least two nurses taking care of a single child. But that doesn't happen in 80% of India where these two nurses are taking care of at least 80 such babies who are in critical care condition. And most of these babies are suffering from a lot of things that can go wrong with babies, but primarily there will be three things that these babies suffer from, which have to be identified at the right time, and care given at that right time will help save the babies, or care given at the right time can actually prevent morbidity. As in, these babies somehow do survive these conditions, but when they are not identified at the right time and not early enough, these babies go on to suffer neurodevelopmental disorders and things like that, which can be prevented if these conditions were identified early on. So these three main conditions are hypothermia, apnea, and respiratory distress. Uh, so most of the equipment which um, what I started to realize with my immersion is uh, are donated. Most of these equipment that are in most of these tertiary care NICUs are donated, but they are not designed for the constraints or the environment that we serve in, which is typical of a developing country. And most of them end up in an equipment graveyard, which is which cannot be used and most of them do not work. They do not have maintenance and services which will help, uh, um, sorry, am I not audible? Okay, okay, okay. Um, so they are not um, lost, what I was saying, okay. So basically what we had come up with um, was a simple diagnostic solution, a simple Mon monitoring equipment that doesn't really qualify as big equipment, simple to use, designed for constraints of the developing world, and something that will cater to what we are talking about or the basic need of monitoring. So we came up with what we call, one of the doctors actually called it a Fitbit for babies, so we continue with that description, but yeah, uh, we developed a wearable solution that can be hooked on to the baby's foot uh, through that little adhesive band that you see. Uh, monitors six clinical vital parameters which are important to understand the health condition of the baby. And um, there are no wires or probes attached. This is completely mobile, a portable solution. 
and all of this is now monitored wirelessly and when there is a distress condition like apnea or hypothermia or respiratory distress identified with the baby, it immediately alerts the nurse through a mobile or a tablet. So basically multiple such babies in the hospital, now in the certain condition that we are talking about, 40 babies in the hospital, each of them have a wearable uh, and cost-wise we try to keep it at the same price. Um, uh, all of them can be monitored simultaneously and when there is a distress that is going on with them, the nurse, the, the tablet or the monitoring um, uh, mobile solution sitting at the nursing station will immediately alert the nurse about what's going on with the baby and they can immediately go and attend to the baby. So that's how it looks. Basically, um, it's a completely um, complete solution because we tried to uh, identify as many parameters as we can through that solution and as many distresses that we can through that one single solution. It, uh, it is something that can be uh, continuously used uh, up to prolonged like a month or two months of usage depending on the baby's condition. And what we are trying to strive for is um, this solution currently under clinical trial, we've done multiple pilots and uh, studies before, is uh, almost ICU grade monitoring that can now be provided outside of an ICU. So uh, let me talk about um, some problems with ICUs, in ICUs. Uh, so let it be a developing uh, rural setting or a completely uh, tech enabled developed setting. What happens is for a prolonged stay inside an ICU, inside an NICU, patients are at more risk, especially with babies. They are more prone to infections and um, it's just not a nice environment for them to be for prolonged periods, especially which uh, requires, uh, if the baby requires uh, recovering from their illness. Uh, where the baby has to be is at the mother's side. So the earlier we can start breastfeeding, the earlier they can start bonding with the mother, the earlier that comfort of the parent is with the baby, the earlier they recover. So the, pa the, the parents, the healthcare workers, the doctors, all of them, one single thing that they try to do is to bring the baby down or outside of an ICU as early as they can so they can recover faster. And that was one thing that we were trying to enable through the solution and we put in more effort to make it a wearable was that. So that's one of the reasons. So what we actually sell to the patients, uh, the, to the doctors is the wearable, the software, uh, the tablets or the monitoring uh, equipment, uh, the, the screens and the uh, consumables or the adhesive band uh, which goes along with the device. So yeah, like I was talking about uh, the baby stepping down from an ICU, it's the faster that they do, it's better. So this is the device in action at various uh, clinical settings that we are currently involved in. Um, so yes, coming back to what um, we wanted to talk about today um, um, was specific to like despite us being engineers, businessmen, uh, doctors or whoever, when we are talking about bringing about an innovation in healthcare, one thing that we are all trying to uh, is to aim for behavioral change. I think the most uh, important outcome of uh, adoption of any innovative solution in the field of healthcare is to drive behavioral change. And field of healthcare is the toughest for behavioral change to happen. So good old, um, I'll talk about a small use case or a small uh, problem that we try to solve uh, using the design thinking process uh, inside of our company, uh, especially leading a team of engineers trying to do this. Uh, it's a little difficult, but then we try to incorporate that and it's uh, what I look at it as a case study. So we go back to this, uh, um, the key aspects of design thinking. When anybody talks about design thinking to you, it's, it's primarily these things where uh, when we're talking about a human-centered approach to solving a problem, one is um, one aspect of that is desirability. Do people really require it, need it, or desire the solution? The other aspect of it is, is it feasible? Uh, is technologically, is it possible to accomplish? And the third main aspect, or, or what we completely try to ignore is, um, as innovators, is the viability. Is it possible that this solution can actually be viably sold or processed? 
uh, in the current environment or the context that we are talking about. So I'll talk about the small problem that we had on hand. Um, so we had come up with the, the sensor module. We said, OK, the, the entire effort uh, that we put in when we identified that this is what the solution needed um, to be, we put in all our effort to make the small sensor module, which was the size of like a two rupee coin, uh, and put shoved every technology, all that we can do into that small PCB and put it and made it. And then we, had, we went back. And we had an interesting problem. We said, how do we put it on the baby? Um, so we had multiple ways that we had to go about it. Uh, when, because when we initially thought about the solution, this did not seem like a problem. We thought, OK, this is just strapping it all on a baby. It's not be a problem. Um, when we went in and started to see the challenges is when we understood the simplest of the things that you think are simple are sometimes supposed or posed to be the toughest of challenges on the field. So I'll talk about the first one, the people. When we uh, went in and uh, we had to look at this solution, um, it especially gets difficult for us or for most of the startups or most of the companies in healthcare when your customer is different from the person who's paying the money for the eventual product versus the person who's actually going to be using it versus the person who's actually going to deploy it on the person who's going to be using it. So it is a little complex. When I said, when somebody asked me, who's your user? I said, I wish that is a, that simple, you know? <laughs> who's my user? <laughs> so uh, in this case, uh, we are putting the product on a baby. But 90% of the time, a nurse is using it or actually putting it on a baby. Uh, but we actually uh, sell the solution to the doctor. But the doctor eventually gets his money for the solution from the patient. So it's a little complex, but yeah. Um, then we had to identify this, but then um, people or user is not some, most of the time he's not alone. We have multiple influencers who we have to take care of. In our case, if the solution, if my thing or my product has to go on that little baby, it has to go through a doctor who listens to a KOL or a, a person who is going to influence his opinion. It has to go through a person who is eventually going to distribute it into the market versus the actual distributor or the, the biomedical engineer of the hospital or the, the technology person of the hospital has to approve it for usage. And eventually, there's going to be this mother-in-law, the mother of the pregnant lady, who's going to ask, what is that, and why is that going on the baby? Is something wrong? So everybody influences that little solution that has to go there. And all of these people's best interests have to be taken care of. So in our immersion or in the process, in the last three years that we built the solution, we, we had spoken or had meaningful conversations with more, more than 100 doctors, 250 nurses, 20 hospitals, five UNICEF-led newborn care centers to actually get to that point, where we started thinking about what everybody requires and what are the important things that we need to look at. But when we talk about uh, you know, when most of us like to use solutions that have been rationally thought about or designed. Uh, so most of it, it is either observation, reality, we gather evidence, data, intellectual analysis of that data is required. But, but when we are talking about designing in the field of healthcare, I think there is a slightly different perspective to look at it, and that is intuitive thinking. When your empathy gives you the insight required to put that particular feature into that product. So we need to look at it from a different perspective. And that's what we started. And that's what I had a tough time building into my team. I think we all have tough time trying to make people understand that. But uh, I think it's a very important in, um, thing to kind of inculcate into your team or inculcate into your company very early on uh, to build your products. So uh, what we do when we go for immersion or look at these people, we, we ask them, we ask people, what do you need? But 90% of the time, this is what happens. People don't know what they need. People don't, people don't um, do what they think they do. People don't do what we think they do. Uh, because uh, one of the interesting imp uh, experiences I have with NICU is um, in these NICUs, the nurses are so overworked and talking, are doing so many tasks that you actually can't even fathom. I think if you have taken care of a newborn baby, you would understand. Taking care of one newborn baby, 
multiply that by 80 or 90. Uh, and all of them in critical care situations. So that's crazy. So this, this nurse is, um, you know, holding a baby in a hand, putting it precariously on a desk, uh, you know, tearing open, uh, tearing open the IV cannula packaging with her mouth, uh, inserting that while the baby is precariously, pa have you ever gotten your blood drawn from a vein? hundred times more difficult to put an IV cannula onto a baby. Yeah, so uh, doing that while simultaneously listening to the cries, to the monitoring equipment, to hundred other things, and she has to do this, she can't lose a second because she has to go back and enter all that data into her case sheets and make all that uh, ready for the next doctor's uh, round. So hundred things. And I asked her, what do you need? She said, I don't need anything. <laughs> I don't need anything. Because uh, they really don't know what they need. You know, because they're so used to doing this on a daily basis, especially in the field of healthcare where they've gone through years of training to do that one particular thing. They don't need anything unless you give them something that will like open their eyes and are like, oh, maybe this is what we can do. But what we can do instead of asking people is silently observe them in that context, in the context of their work environment. And that gives the empathy which will give you the insight to design for these people. Feasibility. So uh, we had an interesting uh, problem. We said um, we had to design the solution. We had to make it um, easy to put on a baby. Uh, but then uh, we had 100 other things that we had to think about. One was why would they use this particular thing, you know? Uh, so they have a pulse oximeter probe that they have to replace on a baby every six hours, and they clean it with sterilium, and every four hours they open it and put it back. Uh, so when we made this band, this fabric band, we went in, and actually I actually timed the amount of time required to uh, put this band on a baby, uh, open it from the from its package and put it on a baby versus the regular pulse oximeter or cleaning it with sterilum. Uh, ours takes at least three seconds lesser time, and I thought that was an achievement. So uh, they don't have a second to lose. They don't have the time when I say an extra step when I introduce it into their uh, scheme of things. They just don't have the time to do it. They, they, uh, when, I, when, he, when we initially went in and we gave them a silicon band with, through which they could actually put in and then we said we have to clean it uh, and put it because we have to absolutely make sure uh, that, that uh, the band is clean uh, before it goes on to another baby because instead of saving babies, we could be killing babies by passing on infection. You know, that's, that's what we could do. So I said, uh, how is it going to happen? And then when we started to prototype that experience of shifting it from one baby to another baby, that's when we realized it has to be a disposable. It has to be something that after a single usage has to be thrown away. And we had to, we initially then came up with this being a disposable adhesive band, but we had higher problems to tackle. We wanted, we had to track every time this was going to be used. So we had to make it a QR enabled packaging that is tamper proof, and can, has to be scanned before usage. Um, so I can go on about the technical part of this, but I don't think the time will allow <laughs> right now. Uh, so one thing that I can talk about, or one, one important uh, point that I want to share with your um, technological feasibility is prototype. Prototype as af often as you can, and prototype not just the product, prototype the experience of using it, and go back to the field as often and as uh, often that you can. So it, it started out with that very rudimentary form to multiple materials, multiple ways we were uh, putting it on, multiple times the, uh, sl it's slipping off, the, the light had to be blocked every time it had to be put on a baby. We had multiple challenges technically trying to solve it. I don't think we have completely solved it yet, but we are, it's in a, it's in a place where we are able to uh, successfully deploy it in the hospitals, but yeah, it took multiple iterations. I think it took about uh, close to a year of iterations to kind of get to that point where you're not just thinking about how to put it on, what material to manufacturing, uh, manufacture it in, what is the safer thing to do. So we had an interesting issue. So we, when, what you see here was, uh, it was initially, uh, one of the iterations we had it was, uh, it was in silicone. It was in medical grade silicone that then had adhesive and it would stick on to the baby. Uh, interestingly, we went and we realized that we just bumped up our comp uh, compliance 
regulatory compliance from one to another by just putting or sticking it on to the foot. So then interestingly we had to take a pivot from there we said okay it cannot stick on the foot but it can stick on itself. So we none of the patch actually sticks on the foot now it sticks on itself but we had to harness it in three multiple points where it would not come off the baby's foot after eight hours yet it would stick for like up to 24 to 48 hours uh, it could be it had to stick only three or four times after the usage because in Indian context you understand that you put it out with a certain intended use and 90% of the time that's not what they're going to be doing they're going to be using it multiple other ways uh, so we had to take care of multiple other things because pulse oximeter uh, causing injuries on babies is one thing that most of the doctors or parents will be concerned about if it went wrong Drastically, uh, it could cause pressure ulcer, it could cause um, pressure injuries, it could cause heat injuries. So all of this had to be taken care of before we finalized on our product. So the viability. Uh, it came down, so interestingly, this is how it became a disposable, blah, 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 or so on. But then we had an interesting question. How do we sell this? So uh, I won't go into the detail of how we went about this, but then um, when we made it uh, adhesive or a reusable, we had to make sure that everybody's interest was at heart. So one of the interesting things that most of the people think when you're designing for healthcare is doctors can live selflessly. They cannot live selflessly. They have to make money. So <laughs> uh, this is coming from a family of doctors. Most of them think that, oh, when you're talking about clinical benefits or clinical good clinical outcomes, doctors are going to adopt it because they're gods. Yes, they're gods on some level, but um, it needs to make money sense. Uh, this coming from a family of doctors, my mom is a doctor, my father's a doctor, my husband's a doctor. What they earn, you know, kind of puts me through school <laughs> and further on, further on. So I understand what it means for them uh, to be able to monetize and also get clinical outcomes. So we had to design this product in such a way that this disposable was going to form uh, a good return on investment for the investment that they're making on that um, product in their hospital and that's how successfully we've designed a model where the doctor was able to make his ROI within the six months of investment while we're able to also provide it under less than a dollar for the patient. So this is another uh, important aspect that you have to keep in mind when you are designing for healthcare. So we think oh this is great five steps of design thinking we can go through all of these five steps and come out with our solution but actually it's going to be like this where you don't know the head or tail uh, you need to learn to live with the chaos and what more importantly you need to um, balance in your team is because it's going to primarily be engineers 90 percent of them are going to be engineers and they don't like chaos they don't like chaos so as designers i think our responsibility is to kind of thrive or teach how people can thrive in chaos and make order of it and use these tools that we can over time develop and practice to build successful solutions in healthcare. Thank you so much and that's where I end and if you have any questions I think Ashish has elaborate mechanism planned for it. <laughs> we'll get back. Thank you.